All right, let's do this. Welcome back to the Hockey Minute. I am your host, Brandon, and I've got a huge show for you guys today. A great interview with Jeff Patterson of the VanCast, former Canucks reporter for TSN 1040 before they were ruthlessly dissolved by Bell. But first, a little housekeeping we have to get to. Uh, Matt, Ryan, Jules, and Marcus have all moved on from the Hockey Minute to work on other projects. I'm super proud of everything that we built with those guys and uh, just stoked to have met them and, and made some friendships and uh, got my feet wet in podcasting with them. I think we should all be proud of what we did. So yeah, hats off to, to those guys for getting her this far. And I can't wait to see what they come up with in the future. But going forward, it's just going to be me uh, conducting interviews and doing the editing. So it may be a little rougher around the edges than we're used to without Matt's hands on the wheel. Uh, but I know we're going to have a lot of fun on the way. So uh, we're going to have one weekly show with a short rant about what's going on with the Canucks or NHL at large or this week, uh, Bell and maybe some Canadian stuff. But we'll follow it up with an interview from someone from around the hockey world. Today, we're blessed to have who I think is the premier Canucks reporter in the market. The one and only Jeff Patterson, who, again, foolishly let go by Bell uh, for a second time. The man is resilient. But speaking of Bell, that brings me to this week's rant. OK, Bell, let's talk. Let's talk. Less than two weeks after Bell's Let's Talk Day, thousands of sports fans across Vancouver were shocked to hear that a station they had been listening to for 20 years was being unceremoniously yanked off the air. An institution of Vancouver sports, for so many, their main connection to what felt like a family of other tortured sports fans had the plug pulled without anyone able to as much as say goodbye. That's right, at 9.30 a.m., the Halford and Bruff show cut away for a regular break and never returned. No, instead they were packing up their belongings as series' heartless corporate brother robotically informed the listeners the station would be changing to a comedy format. And in a joke that could only be considered diabolically tone deaf, they followed up their cold dismissal by playing out the station to Green Day's good riddance. Twist the knife a little more. There now sits a massive void in the Vancouver sports marketplace, and it was Bell's huge mistake to let all of that talent walk. There's no denying Vancouver's market is worse for it. And selfishly, I hope all of those who lost their jobs find new homes to talk sports in our market. I mean, local sports content is simply better with more voices and competition. But like I told my wife the day it happened, I feel terrible for all the people who lost their jobs. But again, selfishly, who I really feel bad for is me. And I know there are thousands of you in Vancouver who feel the same way, but there's something here that all Canadians should be pissed about whether you like sports radio or not. Bell availed itself of the Canadian emergency wage subsidy to the tune of $122 million, a program intended to assist employers who have seen a drop in revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic and to enable them to rehire workers, help prevent further job losses and ease their business back into normal operations. Well, there is a clause in that application that states that the employer is under no obligation to prove that the decline in revenue is related to the COVID-19 crisis. All they had to do to qualify for the subsidy was show at least a 30% downturn in year-over-year -year revenue. So Bell held up its declining media division as the reason for receiving the subsidy and then kept the division open long enough for the check to clear. That's right, corporations applying to the program have no need to prove that their financial downturn was COVID related, and there appears to be no oversight or consequences for abusing the program. So Bell Media, sitting on $5.2 billion of available liquidity, is freely permitted to dip their hands into the coffers of the Canadian government, take 122 million of our tax dollars, lay off hundreds of employees across the country, increase their quarterly dividend payout to shareholders, and face absolutely no consequences as small and medium-sized businesses across the country shut their doors at an alarming rate. So, Bell, let's talk in my office. I won't be using your services anymore. And I know a hell of a lot of Canadians who feel the same. Good riddance. All right, listening to the Hockey Minute, I am Brandon Frederick, and that was this week's rant brought to you by absolutely nobody. For sponsorship opportunities, drop me a line at hockeyminute at gmail.com. And one final quick note, I am stoked to share with all of you the new intro to the show uh, featuring the legendary Ray Ferraro and maybe a little drop from uh, our very own Ryan Hawk. So uh, keep your ears sharp. Hope you guys enjoy the interview with the phenomenal Jeff Patterson. Hey, it's Ray Ferraro from TSN and the Ray and Drake's Hockey Podcast. I was going through some stuff and I realized there's another podcast out there, the Hockey Minute. Burrow steals, cutting in, shoots, scores! They've 
slayed the dragon! Really? Another hockey podcast? Another podcast in general? And like, is it a minute long? Or is it like a full podcast? the first open ice big hit that Scott Stevens has shown in the series. Paul Correa landed on his back and didn't move. And the fans on their feet because Paul Correa has just come back from the dressing room wow. and onto the bench. Into the zone, Sakura kicked it out, got it back here side Correa. Correa, the fans want one. I really can't get behind this idea. I mean, like, what the hell do you know about hockey? And who is the hockey man? Who? Like, anybody. Anybody know? Curry, McSorley, to Gretzky! Scores! He did it! He did it! The greatest goal scorer in National Hockey League history! Find out. Listen. Check it out. I mean, it's only going to take a minute. It won't take that much time. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to see if this podcast is any good. But do you even know how to skate? And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! Be well, Hockey Minute. Be well, Brandon. Later. All right, Jeff Patterson of the VanCast joins us now of the uh, now on the Hockey Minute. Uh, Jeff was a longtime member of the TSN 1040 team uh, as their in-house Canucks reporter, as well as the founder of the legendary PatCast. Jeff's voice is absolutely synonymous with Canucks coverage, and in my opinion, he is the gold standard. Jeff, thanks so much for doing this. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for asking, and it's good to have a place to talk hockey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's good to hear your voice, man. So let's, uh, let's get right into the, to the Canucks stuff before we get into anything else. And uh, I think anybody in, in, who's paying too much attention to the Canucks, like I am looking for anything going on i uh, just saw pod coles and take a brutal headshot in in the khl today uh maybe it was better off when they were just playing in five minutes a game yeah i saw that too it's uh, scary stuff uh, yeah. anytime you see anybody down and, and need help off the ice uh, due to a head injury you, you know you, you feel for them and especially for yeah. this guy that uh the canucks have high hopes for and, and you just love how hard he plays and competes and you know it, it was unfortunate i don't think yuri Latera. Uh, from his brief time in the National Hockey League, it was that kind of player. Yeah. But Colson turned into the hit too a little bit, so he probably has to own some of it. But bottom line is the hit happened, and uh, he looked like he was in pretty rough shape. So I uh, hope for a, a speedy recovery, and uh, I think the hope is still that uh, he's going to find his way over here before the season is through, uh, can get through quarantine and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and it'll be great if we can see him in a Canuck uniform, uh, even for a handful of games. But that may be asking too much. Uh, you may have to wait until the start of next season, whatever the case, uh, he figures yeah. into the Canucks plans for next year and beyond. And this certainly looks like you're the kind of guy that can, can help this group moving forward. Yeah, man, he's, he's exactly what the, what the Canucks need. And, you know, if I were Jake Britannon, and I'd be looking over my shoulder at Pod Colson and thinking that's probably the guy that's going to take my spot on this team come next season. If I can't carve out a way uh, to, to find myself uh, as a useful part of this team. Yeah, it would be example number 57 or something like that for Jake <laughs> yeah. Tannen. Uh, yeah. You just you keep waiting and thinking that something is going to trigger him into becoming the player that everybody thought he would. And yet at 24, maybe he's already there. Uh, and that's the frustrating part. You know, he, he watched last summer in the bubble when a guy like Zach McEwen had a pretty good training camp and, yeah. and moved past him. And then Hoaglander comes to camp this time around as a 20 year old, you know, touching down in North America for the first time. And the motor just hasn't stopped. And even yeah. though the Canucks have had their struggles, we all rave about uh, Hoaglander. And yet, you know, it just doesn't seem like anything's really clicked. Here we are. Uh, I know Jake hasn't played all the games, but uh, the next one will be their 20th game of the season. They stuck on one goal, one point. Like, it just, yeah. what's it going to take uh, for him to sort of find his own motivation? And that's been the frustration throughout. And it's so hard to think that, this was an 18 goal score. Everybody figured that he'd be 20 by the end of the regular season had COVID not hit and 
the hope obviously was that that was going to be a launch pad for him. And here he sits basically a third of the way through this shortened season on one goal. And at that, it was a pinball that night in Calgary. Like, you know, he hasn't beaten the goaltender cleanly himself. Uh, they all count, but yeah. stuck on one at the one third mark of the season. Uh, who knows? Like, is he going to get to five on the year based on the way that he's playing and being utilized and in and out of the lineup? And is he going to make it uh, past the trade deadline? And I think a lot of people would probably hope that maybe the Canucks could pedal him and, and yeah. just move him on and, and, you know, start fresh somewhere else and see if it can happen for him there. But uh, it's yeah. frustrating. There's no doubt, uh, as we all know, seems to have the natural tools, but uh, just that <laughs> unwillingness to, uh, to engage on a nightly basis and, um, yeah, it's, it's been tough, and you can understand why Travis Green has got to that point where he's not a regular in the lineup anymore. What do you think the, the hesitance is on Jim Benning's part to move on from him is? I mean, he could have let him walk as an RFA. Is, it, is he just too scared to let his sixth overall pick from that one year kind of go for nothing? He's, he's worried about the storyline. Like, like I just if you put yourself in his shoes, I mean, where is that coming from? Because now he's almost untradeable, I think, looking at the contract next year. Right, salary, so right? It, it may not even be a you know, an unwillingness to trade and maybe an yeah. inability to trade. Yeah. And I do think that, and I guess on some level, I understand if that's your first draft pick and you're a guy that, you know, has this reputation of being a draft guru and, and uh, the idea of him going somewhere else and flourishing, but come on, he's 24 and it really hasn't happened for him. Yeah. And I, I just, I think we know now that the league's getting younger by the year you know, if you're 24, most time, then you're an outlier if you somehow find some magic after the age of 24. Yeah. Um, but, you know, look, this organization has certainly taken its fair share of knocks this year and, and the idea of peddling for 10 and having him blossom somewhere else. So I, I guess I understand the reluctance, but at the same time, uh, they committed to him. That didn't look great now. It's uh, not going to look a whole lot better if he doesn't improve. And, and I, quite frankly, I don't know that they're, would be a taker out there uh, in a yeah. flat cap world, given the contract that he's got and the fact that it was back end loaded and they're going to owe him more money next year than they are this year. Uh, you know, the cap hits the same. So yeah, yeah it's unfortunate. Uh, I didn't think that he would be an 18 goal score, 20 goal score. No, I, I expected to be some regression. I didn't think it would be to this point this soon. And I also, you know, it's not just Jake, it's Adam Goddett really seems to have kind of taken a big step back, although he's looked a little bit better here the last couple of games. But that trio of Vertan and Godet and McEwen, you know, all in the same age range, all vying for essentially the same kind of ice time, no special teams, or at least no penalty kill. Jake and Godet played power play. But, um, and you would have thought that one of those three would have recognized the other two are struggling and that, you know, there was an opportunity if they upped their game and were able to, to bring a consistency on a nightly basis. And yet yeah. all three have kind of scuffled long all season long to the point that all three were healthy scratches that one night in Toronto, not that long ago. And it was impossible, impossible not to recognize that Lou Erickson and Justin Bailey were playing ahead of any of those three, yeah. that that's kind of what yeah. it had come to in the eyes of yeah. Travis Green. So, you know, a lot of folks on Jake because he's the local guy and he was the high pick, but I think there's enough to go around where all three of those guys, the hope was they were all going to take a step forward and be a part of the solution. And now it's fair to ask, you know, what is the future of any of those three with the organization as far as really being legitimate every night contributors? Because right now, uh, all three of them are having trouble getting into the lineup and staying there on the regular. Yeah, and, and I think Adam Gaudet's a really interesting case because, like, in, for him at least, I, I don't think effort is is the question at all. I think he's given that his all, his all every night. I just think that he might not quite have the tools to be able to keep up at this level. Yeah, and this is a guy that had such a good training camp and yeah. preseason at the start of a year ago when they had the training camp in Victoria, and then they just kept playing in the preseason, and he kept responding and producing. And, and I think he was one of those guys that, you know, wanted to play every night in the preseason because it's mm -hmm. easier to make a name for yourself if you're on the ice doing things rather than sitting out and watching other guys get an opportunity. And, and you know, he really kind of kicked down the door to being the third-line center. And we've seen, yeah. look, this guy has the offensive chops. Like, it has never been about producing at this level. It's been away from the park, defensive responsibilities, you know, to the point that they talked about trying to find him a penalty-killing role so that he could up his ice time. And... You know, I, I don't know. I, I, it's tough, especially in this Zoom world, not being in the room and getting a chance just to pull guys aside and actually talk to them and 
and sort of getting inside their minds. Uh, so I don't know what's happened with Gaudet. I, I agree with you. The effort is generally not the issue. And I think he has looked better in the last few games, but it shouldn't have come to the point where he had to be a, a healthy scratch mm-hmm. repeatedly. Uh, he lost his third line center job to Brandon Sutter, who, yeah. you know, 20 games into the season doesn't have an assist. Like how can you be a third line center in the national hockey league yeah. and not have an assist? Like that, that's crazy talk. And yet there we are. Um, and got it. You're right. Like his future maybe is a winger, uh, but there has to be some sort of tangible takeaway at the end of the night. It's just been yeah. way too many nights. You know, he had the huge first period in Calgary early in the season. I think he had five shots and eight attempts or something and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, had all kinds of great opportunities. But, you know, I don't want to talk about chances and opportunities. I, I want to talk about the goals that he scored. And uh, it just it hasn't happened for him. And even the one night that he did score in Montreal, he had that egregious giveaway, too, that had led to the shorthanded goal. So, you know, that negated some of the good that he had done that night. And mm-hmm. uh, it's just it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle for so many guys for the Vancouver Canucks early on. I mean, that's why they are where they are as they approach the 20 game yeah. mark. And uh, I mean, uh, I think most people now are kind of looking at Jim Benning and thinking that he's kind of the, uh, the, the, the reason that they're in this position that they're in. I mean, you, you have to give him credit for his draft record. We, like we all know the story, right? But we're, the Canucks are kind of in the position they are because of the bloat that they have around that they were using. And it's funny, you know, like the, the Aquilinis have to take part of this blame too, because they had the taps cranked up uh, for the last five seasons while the Canucks were middling to try and keep them in their middling position, you know, who, who knows why or, or what they spent the way that they did. But now the taps are off for this season and it couldn't be a, a, a worse time in, in terms of the franchise to have the kind of the tap shut off, to have the buy off, buy out power to be cut off and, and kind of feel like Jim Benning's hands are tied. But at, at the same time, I mean, we're coming into what's probably like, I, I, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say this is one of the biggest off seasons that this franchise is going to have, at least for the next 10 or 15 years, right? With all the RFAs coming up with Pedersen, with Hughes, um, with all these contracts that they need to try and get under the bar, they, they could either be a contender for the next five years or just, you know, spinning in the mud. So, I mean, when, when, when you heard Francesco or when you read Francesco's kind of a uh, kiss of death, I mean, uh, what did, what, what did you think of that whole situation? Do you think that he's just putting it off till the end of the season or, I mean, how did you take it? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot to unpack there, obviously. I, yeah, I, I applaud him speaking out to the fans. I don't, yeah necessarily like that it was on twitter because it's a one-way street and right you know we just have to take his word i i as a reporter and a guy that's been in the biz forever i you know i, I really wish that he was willing to sit down uh, he can sort of control the environment but i wish he would answer some questions say you know mm-hmm. for him to come out and say what he said that's fine but you know he also took shots at the media but nobody knows what was he really upset about and so that leads to more speculation and that's kind of the nature of the beast, but that's how he chooses to communicate. I applaud that he communicates with the fans. I, I just, I, I think the fans in this market have lined that family's pockets with so much money over the years yeah. that there is an inherent responsibility on a couple of, you know, twice a year, even to just handle some questions uh, about the state of the hockey club. And, you know, there was a lot in there, things like, Oh, they didn't have much of a training camp. Yes, they had 10 days of training camp. They had the same amount of training camp as everybody else. Like, yeah. you know, don't use this notion that it's a weird year for the Vancouver Canucks because it's a weird year for every team in the league. In fact, I think it's been stranger for a lot of the American teams, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and so that kind of, again, I, I just think you can't take it at face value. You have to push back a little bit. And, um, you know, for him to say he's not going to panic, well, that's fine but you know at the same time if he says they're going to stay the course right now the course is that they're a 7 11 and 1 hockey club and basically yeah. they're buried before the end of february which is insane to think about when the season started in mid-january <laughs> but they have yeah. dug themselves an incredible yeah. hole that i think is now probably insurmountable and I, I won't rule them out they had a 14 and 3 run a year ago i mean that team didn't show any signs of getting on a, a bender like that. And it did. So, you know, th- there's recent proof that it can happen, but you know, what are the chances it's going to happen two years in a row to, to go on that sort of hot streak? So uh, just a lot there, the timing, I didn't necessarily like the timing. I, I thought it could have been done a week earlier in Toronto when mm-hmm. they really were spiraling out of control with two bad losses in Montreal, followed by two losses in Toronto. Uh, I kind of thought that might've been a more appropriate time to try to take some of the heat off Travis Green and the organization 
And look, ownership has to wear some of this. You know, if this is a product of organizational instability, then they had the opportunity to extend the coach and just you know eliminate that storyline before the season began. And they opted not to. And I get that, you know, resources are are tougher now than you know, then the Aquilines aren't going hungry, but I get that revenue is, is all but dried up for the hockey club and concerts and all those things. Still, I think there were ways you could have structured an extension for Travis Green to give him the security he was looking for and maybe some back end money the way they did with some of the players as well. Uh, you know, put in some clauses that if you make the playoffs, there's bonuses and those types. Like, I think there were ways. And so I think the ownership brought some of this on themselves and i think too there was an opportunity for jim benning to buy out a player like brandon sutter to create some cap space give himself a little flexibility and again it sounds like uh, his hands were tied there uh jim doesn't escape the blame for all of those other contracts that he assigned including yeah. brandon sutter yeah. but you know there's plenty to go around here at lots of levels and so for ownership just to come out and start to point fingers at the media the media is not responsible for the losses. The media is not responsible for the giveaways, the poorest defense, the goaltending, uh, all those types of things. So it's always an easy scapegoat. I get it. And he's probably not happy with some of the coverage that his team has received. But at the same time, uh, I just, to me, my back kind of goes up a little bit when I see people trying to deflect and blame it on the media. The media should be the, you know, way, way down uh, the list of the Aquilini's concerns right now. Right. And uh, just to, to put the Canucks record into context, you, you put out a tweet earlier that said the Canucks need to go something like 23, 13 and one uh, to make yeah. the, the, the perceived playoff bar of 62 points. So they need to win basically two out of every three games. And I mean, I just I don't know, man, <laughs> look at this team. I think that you'd have to be kind of crazy to think that they're going to make it. I mean, it's, it's good to be a fan and good to be hopeful. But I think it might be the year to start thinking about, well, can, is this the final year that we can be a seller going into the offseason and then really load up for uh, for some contending years a little bit lighter? they have to navigate and negotiate to, around all of this. But if you're trading players away and you're trading the American teams and trying to bring players in, you know, you, you better get a jump on it. They'd probably be better off to do it sooner rather than later. I think there'll be yeah. fewer trades just because of the quarantine and you don't want to get left holding the bag. And you've got a player like Tanner Pearson. Like, they have to decide what to do. You know, there's definitely some chemistry there with Bo Horvath and Hoaglander and that line has been pretty good, but yeah, what is, you know, what's Pearson going to want? And, you know, he's seen a player like Toffoli go and get money and find a, a home elsewhere and, and settle in there and, and their buddies. So Pearson's going to be an interesting one. Sutter, obviously, you know, Alex Adler, I don't think he is going to wave uh, to, to go. I just think that's the storyline that we probably shouldn't even pursue at this point. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, then you look at guys like Vertanen and Gaudet and, uh, you know, would Sutter have a little bit of value? Probably, um, you know, even just as the penalty killer, if a team was out there that felt that, that was an area that they, they had to shore up. Uh, Pearson's got some experience, obviously, in playoffs past and, and last summer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll be curious. I'll, I'll be curious to see how they handle this trade deadline. You know, it, this management group at times has been too loyal to its players. And I, I think they have to recognize that. Uh, and I'm sure they do. Uh, if they're the ones that are going to be negotiating the contracts for Patterson and Hughes and, and throw Thatcher Demko in there as well. If he has, yeah. you know, even a decent season, he's going to be in for a raise too. And, and there isn't going to be a whole lot of money to go around. So uh, there's no question. I mean, the Hughes Patterson deals arguably, the most important contracts that the organization has ever signed. I mean, the Sedins yeah. uh, along the way, I suppose, uh, you know, there's probably uh, a, a case to be made for them in their heyday, but, but these are no question uh, contracts that are going to impact the Canucks in the short term and the long term as well. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's going to be a fascinating watch here to see who in fact is uh in charge who, who's going to be the one like, you know yeah. it, 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 we heard that uh, ownership had the backs of uh, this management group so no changes in the short term i suppose but uh, we've seen that contracts are not jim benning and john weisbrod's strong suit necessarily like you know what is the confidence level of the consumer yeah. and those two have their hands on the wheel to get these deals done and to get them to a point that you know they fit into a structure that will allow them to do some other things, because that's the frustrating part, I think, for so many people is, you know, they know that the Pedersen and Hughes deals are coming down the pipe, 
and I think a lot of people think too, uh, well, I know that some contracts are coming off the books, but you know, he, he, Erickson's still on the books and Beagle and Roussel and Tyler Myers. And, you know, there isn't a lot of wriggle room until they totally get out from under uh, a few of those contracts. And so I, I think, you know, we would, if we did this a year from now, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of the storylines would sound the same about bloated contracts, hamstring the general manager and his ability to, yeah. you know, really move this group forward here. And you owe it to Horvat and you owe it to Besser. And if you want JT Miller to resign when his contract's up, I think you got to show it to him that, you know, you're going to make some strides here and start to bring in some support players at reasonable dollars that yeah. fit into the overall structure of what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, you know, on the surface, it just it doesn't seem that difficult. And yet this management group really has had its issues finding those types of players and being willing to, you know, fill gaps in this lineup with dollar like contracts that make way more sense. And, and I, I want to believe that every bad contract like is something that this group would have learned from. But you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, when you ice a fourth line that has $11 million in contracts in, you know, in a game a couple of weeks ago, like mm -hmm. that, that's crazy. Like that really, that is nuts to think that Bertan and Beagle and Erickson were on the line yeah. together in one of those games in Toronto at 11 and a half million bucks. Like, right. but that's where they are. And that's a big reason why they are, uh, you know, that's why they're in problems that, that they've yeah. got right now. And I, I think Green is kind of doing the best that he can with the group that he's got. And uh, I think that the Canucks fans that want Green gone are, are pretty misguided and should probably be a little bit fearful of what's going to come in and replace him should should that happen, right? I mean, if you look at Mike Babcock and his deployment of, of Austin Matthews on the power play and those kinds of things during his tenure in Toronto, and, and, and he's a guy that I've heard talked about coming into Vancouver, and I don't think that's going to happen anyway. The Aquilinis aren't going to pay to get him off the couch, but I just mean in general, like I think Green is, is, a, is a very good NHL coach, and the Canucks are going to be awfully sore if he gets kind of thrown out with the wash. Yeah, look, Travis Green and I have butted heads. That that comes with the territory. I have a ton of oh, yeah. respect for him, and, and I think like, I think he's a good person, and and uh, he's done a pretty good job as a coach too. I mean, yeah. you know, improvement year over year for the most part. And obviously, we'll see where this season goes. Uh, but you know, some of the, the decisions he made early to put Patterson at center ice at the National Hockey League level to sort of groom Quinn Hughes for a month and then turn him loose as a first unit power play guy. Uh, you know, eventually, it you know, it, it would have got to that, but I think he didn't put Quinn Hughes in a position to fail right off the bat. Like he knew that this mm -hmm. market is, um, you know, th this market would have wondered a little bit had they gone with Hughes right off the bat as the the quarterback on PP one, and it hadn't worked. And so I think he yeah. let him just kind of feel his way through the first little bit in the National Hockey League, and then they turned to him and you know, that'll be his place for, for years to come. But, uh, you know, I, I've made this point before I, at first, I kind of had to convince myself that there was something there that, you know, here's Travis Green without a contract extension and there was the Seattle Kraken without a head coach. And I saw yesterday where the ownership group said, Oh, they may wait till the end of the season to see who among the current coaches is available. And that like, Whoa, hang on a yeah. second here. Like all of a sudden it gets pretty real until either Green gets his extension or the Kraken hire a head coach it feels like there's something there for a guy that played his junior hockey in Washington state coached in Portland and has, yep. you know, the, the BC connections, like the ties to the Pacific Northwest. Now I, in the same breath, you have to recognize that Ron Brindamore in Carolina is in the same boat and he's got ties to Ron Francis. So, yep. you know, who knows who the Kraken truly are looking at, but I don't think Travis Green would, would be able to work long if in fact it doesn't work out. And if he becomes the next guy to walk out the door here, you know, you do have to wonder a little bit about what's going on. So uh, yeah. I, I believe Travis, when he says he wants to be here as a BC guy to finish what he started, I believe Jim Benning, when he, he, he says that, you know, Travis is just the right guy, but Jim may not be the one calling the shots. And then it gets messy if a new GM comes in. We all know how that works in pro sports. So yeah. uh, let's see how it all plays out. And, uh, you know, the, the Canucks can make the life a little easier on themselves if, if they truly think that Travis is a guy then just get an extension done for him like don't yeah. let him flap in the wind any longer because it just doesn't feel fair to him necessarily uh but here we are and i mean they're not that far from the midway mark of this season and you know i don't see any signs that it's going to get done before the end of the year and then 
you know, at that point, look, Barry Trotz and the Washington Capitals parted ways after a Stanley Cup and they all said yeah. the right things. And, and I believe them too. Like, I, I think they wanted to make it work, but it's pro sports and it can sometimes be a messy business. So this to me is a fascinating story to, to watch play out in real time here for the next bunch of months. Yeah, exactly. And uh, like you were just saying, I mean, the Aquilinis <clears throat> haven't really done a whole lot to uh, to kind of ease the the talk about it. I mean, maybe they think, um, you know, there's, there's there's no such thing as bad press, I guess, in a pandemic year, any kind of coverage with, with their name in the press keeps them going, who knows. But um, I just wanted to change gears a, a little bit here, Jeff. I mean, you, you were part of the... Uh, the I mean the massive layoffs that that Bell just went through uh, they were uh, Bell shut down TSN 1040 and uh, among a couple other stations uh, across the country and I just I wanted to kind of get uh, your your thoughts on it maybe where you were when it all happened and kind of your, uh, your your thinking on the situation and yeah it's been a difficult week I'm not gonna lie it's tough personally to lose a, a job that I absolutely loved uh, and it was a dream job. It was. Look, you cover hockey, you travel around North America. I think I didn't think an opportunity like that would really ever present itself. And when it did, you know, I was all in. I jumped in and it was my life. And and I loved it. And I loved it being my life. I was prepared to sort of do it 24-7. And, uh, you know, I gave it my all. And, and uh, you know, I just, I, I, I'm sick and for all of my colleagues that, you know, they're good people and good friends and absolute professionals at what they do and and the market is just so much poor for what went down and so yeah nobody was happy about it uh, I was sitting in this very chair when I got the note that I was to be on a on an all-staff staff conference call in 15 minutes so people have heard the story I think it's out there that you know it did it came down really quickly and caught us all completely off guard i had worked the post game show the night before with blake price i was back on the radio on the morning show or doing a, a hit and and then was on this conference call and it was done just like that so um you know I, I, there are moments where it's tough to believe that 1040 doesn't exist as an all sports station it yeah. uh, but you know you got to be a realist it happened they had their reasons and whether we like them or not, it's done. And so uh, you got to move on with life. And what that means, I don't know. Uh, you know, I've heard from lots of people, uh, amazing outpouring. Uh, I've said to others that you always know there are listeners in the radio game. You know that people are listening. You don't know how many, but you know people are out there. What you don't know is their situations and the, the the stories that I have heard, the outpouring in social media, the phone calls, the texts, DMs, and everything, uh, it it hits you like it right, you know, cuts to your core. The people that talked about, you know, listening to the radio with their grandfather and uh, you know their dying grandfather who loved hockey, and, and they would just sit and listen to the radio. Uh, you know, people that were new to Canada that didn't understand hockey but learned about hockey through listening to us, um, yeah. you know, people that just talked about being a kid and, and really 20 years of 1040 and it's been, you know, there their entire life. And uh, I don't want to say I took listeners for granted, but you just don't know their story. I mean, I'm on one side of the radio, they're on the other. And so right. all these testimonials, like it, it was overwhelming at times and there were some tears shed and I'm not going to lie. Um, and so you know, I appreciate all the, the kind words and sentiments and everybody that tells you uh, you're going to land on your feet and can't wait to see what's next and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. And, and again, it means a lot to me. Uh, the reality of the situation is that there were two all sports stations and one just decided to shutter. And with it went essentially 20 really good jobs and decent paying jobs too. Like, you know, these are pros that had earned uh, the right to make a good living doing what they did among the best in the business. And, and so yeah. those jobs aren't going to be replaced and I have a family and ultimately my responsibility is to my family to be able to support them. And, and so as much as I love doing what I do and, and I'm exploring ways to continue it, um, those types of jobs, just they're hard to come by. And yeah especially when you're as focused on hockey as I have been. And that's my first love. Like these other guys that host talk shows, you know, they've got a broader interest range than I do. I, I watch football, but I am not a hardcore football guy or soccer right. or whatever. Right. 
uh, I loved hockey and I put all my energy into covering the Canucks as much as I could. And, and so uh, that's seasonal. That's part of the problem too. It's, you know, their season is going to be over in May and they don't start up again until September. It's hard to convince somebody to hire you to talk hockey in the summer months when there isn't anything going on. So these are the challenges. It may force me to get a little creative. I may have to cobble together uh, some freelance projects and who knows what I I'm yeah. just in the exploratory stage right now, but I'm just saddened that, uh, you know, it's hard to call a radio station that was 20, it was coming up on its 20th anniversary and we're excited to celebrate the 20th year. Uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a heritage brand necessarily, but I think in some ways in this city, it was, it was first all sports. It had built up a uh, reputation and the following. And just to hear from so many people that, you know, these voices on the radio essentially were like family to them that, uh, you know, they're really feeling our loss too. So thank you to everybody uh, for all of that. It's just, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate the way it went down. It's unfortunate that it did go down at all, but here we are. So uh, let's see where it goes from here. Yeah. Well, man, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's not easy to talk about it, that it, you, you just went through it, but let me just add my, uh, my two cents in there is I, I'm one of those people I've listened to 1040 since it started, since it was the team. I've been lucky enough to travel around quite a bit. I, I lived in the Northwest Territories for seven years. You guys were daily for me there. I was in South America through the 2011 Cup run. You guys were daily for me there. It's just, it, uh, it, it feels like all of a sudden you can't talk to a bunch of your family members. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's like, man, you guys were a part of my daily routine. And I know a lot of people in Vancouver feel the same. And I think it's it's Bell's absolute error to have let all you guys go. Like you're saying, you guys are absolute pros. You're the best in the business. And now there's a massive vacuum in Vancouver. And there's all respect to 650. They're trying, but I can't do it, man. I try and tune in and it's like, oh, I just, I miss the guys. And, it, you know, you get some good coverage, but it's, it's not the same and it's not there. So I, I really am praying for you guys that you can fill the, the vacuum that's there now because, Man, the, the, it, I think 1040 set a, a unique stage for the, the, the sports market. It made Vancouver unlike anywhere else in North America for sports coverage. And, and now uh, there, there's nothing there for it. So, I mean, uh, you, maybe I'll talk to you about it later or whatever. You guys are looking into it. But, um, you know, there, there's, there's lots of neat avenues through the online world now, whether it's through Patreon or any of these uh, uh, other online platforms, right? Some people are doing some pretty neat things. But I think to try and match the salaries that you guys are making off of 1040, that would be the real challenge, right? For eight or 10 guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. That, that, that's it. I mean, the, look, the digital space is the future. Terrestrial radio isn't, yeah. but it's being able to make a living. and yeah finding sponsors and, and people that want to partner with you and, and, and getting it to a level. So that's why I say like, I I'm excited to explore some of that and I'm not ruling out anything at this point, but at the end of the day, uh, I've got a family that I got to feed and, and that's just the stark reality of it. And, and, you know, I'm glad you brought up the point about traveling because that was another thing that the number of people, I tweeted this out last week that you just, you realize what the Canucks mean to so many and the power of the Canuck brand and radio. If you are, you know, the click of a button on a, a phone or however you're delivered, you know, you can be listening to the same thing as somebody sitting in their car in traffic in downtown Vancouver. And uh, I've heard from so many people around the world that, you know, were longtime listeners, whether they were expats and moved or had come to Vancouver and sort of fallen in love with the city and by extension, the Canucks and taking that home with them or whatever. And, and we used to hear from those people, you know, when we would do shows. And, and so I, I was aware of it. I knew that there were Canuck fans all over the place. But again, it sort of galvanized people to, to reach out here in the last week. And, and so that meant an awful lot, too. And you know, I feel bad for those people. And I will say, like, this is an opportunity for 650. They, they've got an opportunity. Yeah. They, they've got some decisions to make about what they want to do. And there are talented people available. And, you know, I mean, the downside there is if they bring people in, the people they've got on the air right now, it may lead to more job loss and nobody wants to see that. But, yeah. you know, at the same time, I, I do think the 650, if they're the only game in town, uh, they sort of owe it to the listeners. And if they want to attract 1040s audience as well, I'm not saying that they got to replicate 1040, but I think they have to step their game up a little bit and show yeah. that they're serious and that they recognize that there are ways that they can bolster their product and, and bring everybody in under the tent. That's the only sports talk radio in town now. So hopefully that, you know, hopefully that they see this as an opportunity uh, to do what they think they've got to do to, uh, to up their game. 
I mean, we don't need to get too into the inside baseball for their, 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 their programming and all that. But just when I look at it from a business perspective, I look at how they've handled Scott Rintoul, who's a friend of the show. He's been on here a couple of times. But I mean, they've got him alone covering two separate markets. To me, that looks like a company that's kind of operating on a shoestring. So I'm really curious to see how it's going to pan out with the kind of influx of talent. Yeah, and not only talent on the street, but all the <clears throat> clients that, you know, longtime clients that were supportive of 1040, there may be an opportunity there yeah, uh, to point. bring some along. And, yeah. You know, so uh, again, it, it's, you hear it a lot, one door closes, another opens. I hope that's the case for me. I hope it's the yeah. case for all of my colleagues, but it may be an opportunity too on the business side for some people to, you know, just shift their advertising dollars. And, and uh, you know, the point has been made that, I think there were a lot of people that wondered if 650 was on shaky ground as the second into the market and all that kind of stuff. You know, ultimately, Bell just showed that they didn't think it was financially viable. Uh, if people want all sports, radio, local, and around the clock for the most part, you know, it's kind of on all of us now to, to step up and give 650 a chance and, and yeah. see what you like. And if there are parts you don't like, you know, reach out, let them know. Like, you know, I, I, it's sort of that whole, it takes a village thing, but it's, it is true. I, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, my hunch is that others will try to pop up online and try some of that. And so maybe there'll be varying degrees of competition in the market, but as far as over the air, uh, it's 650 right now. And <laughs> if it doesn't happen for them and they decide to make, you know, Rogers is a lot of, in a lot of ways, no different than Bell. I mean, it's just it's a big company that's trying to make as much money as it can. And yeah, uh, like imagine going from two all sports to, to none. And I'm not here to say that that's about to happen, but nobody saw what happened to 1040 happening. So, uh, you know, it, the, the city and the sports community would really suffer if all of a sudden there was no all sports radio. So yeah. I'm hoping, I, I'm hoping that some people out there see it as an opportunity to, uh, you know, give 650 a chance, just see what's there. And again, I, I, these are smart people that are running the operation. And I think they would be amenable to hearing from listeners who like things on 1040 that they're not hearing in the market right now. And so, you know, let your voice be heard. It's, uh, that's your right, certainly. And I can't force you to switch the dial there, but uh, I just think for the good, I, at heart, I'm a radio guy. Yep. And I certainly don't want to see what happened to 1040 happen to 650 as well. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it a shot and I hope the guys out there too, but still it's uh it's, it's a different flavor and it's hard going down. Yep. But uh, just uh, real, real quick before I, I run out of my time with you here, Jeff, I want to transition back to the Canucks and uh, kind of the only real bright spot of the season so far that we haven't had a chance to touch on and that that's Niels Hoaglander. And uh, he's, he seems to be embodying all of Yannick Hansen's spirit with that number 36. I mean, man, he's, he's the absolute embodiment of the, that honey badger attitude. And I, I think that he's a, a, a revelation probably for the Canucks as much as the fans. You know, I mean, UC Okanen's old number 36. Uh, <laughs> and there was a little buffer in there between the, uh, Yannick Hansen and, and Niels yeah, Holgren, but yeah. he's, he has, he's been terrific. And, and right from day one of the training camp. And, you know, you think about this guy, 20 years of age, just turned 20 right before Christmas at his birthday, uh, new country, new continent, new league, best league in the world. And didn't look out of place from that first day of training camp. And I, I think Travis Green kind of, you know, a little bit of roll of the dice. And we talked earlier about Trent Patterson as a center in the NHL. Uh, here's a guy coming from the Swedish league, but I think it was the, Travis didn't like the other options, right? He'd had Louie there. He's tried mm -hmm. Jake there. And they thought, why not? Let's see this guy. And, and Travis has admitted that he had seen the highlight videos of uh, the lacrosse goals and the between the leg stuff. And, and, you know, but you can't just be a YouTube sensation. Like you've got to make it on your own in the NHL. And so Hoaglander hit the ground running on that line with Horvat and Pearson, had a really good training camp. And I think like a lot of people, I was like, all right, this is kind of intriguing and, and let's see what he can do. But now it's time mm -hmm. for games. And, you know, it was strange too, just to be doing this as a rookie in a pandemic with nobody in the stands and all of that. Like, but you know, he, he just keeps his head down and goes to work. And I think that's what everybody loves is how hard he works. And, and he's been unlucky. Like, you know, all of his offense at five on five, the second unit power play hasn't done anything yet for the Canucks. And he's yeah. part of that. And, and both horvat has been a little quiet too on him here in the last 10 games or so. I know he scored last night on the power play, but 
you know, you, we saw what Horvat was capable of in the bubble, and you kind of thought, well, the captain will drag Hoaglander along, and there'll be points yeah. to be had there uh, just by osmosis, and that really hasn't happened of late. So hopefully Horvat can get going again, and, and Hoaglander's production can pick up. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for a first go round in the National Hockey League, doesn't look out of place, you know, driving play as a, yeah. as a rookie. And you just love how fearless he is. It seems every game that there's a highlight or two from him and play that, you know, has people buzzing and, and he's just getting started. So yeah, yeah, in a season where the top line players haven't been good enough, defense obviously has been way too porous. Goaltending has been average and average goaltending is not going to cut it. You know, I, I think without a doubt that Niels Hoaglander has been the most pleasant surprise and also being one of the most consistent, I mean, you know, not in point production, but just in work rate and hasn't had many nights where you haven't noticed him. And so that's a credit to him. And uh, I look forward to watching this guy continue to develop and grow and just get better because I think what we've all seen here in the first 20 games of this season, uh, there is certainly something there to, to, for the Canucks to hang their hat on and he belongs. It's as simple as that. So, yeah. uh, They need a few more Niels Hoaglanders along the way here. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, when Pod Golson arrives, I think that'll be fun to watch him do the same sorts of things. Okay, guys, Jeff and I ran into some technical difficulties at the end of the recording there. So, unfortunately, I couldn't sign off with him properly. But a huge thanks to Jeff for coming on the show. Uh, everybody, make sure you check out his work. Uh, the best Canucks podcast going at uh, the Bandcast, as well as at Patterson Jeff on Twitter. Uh, again, Jeff, big thanks, man. It was an honor to talk to you. And I hope that we hear you on those uh, Zoom calls asking Travis the hard questions soon. So thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you next time on the Hockey Minute.